It's hard to properly describe the scorching heat that radiates off of every square inch of the concrete jungle in Phoenix, Arizona during the summer months. But Prosecutor Juan Martinez had a job to do and even the 110 degree weather would not be enough to keep him from meeting his many obligations that day. It was August of 2011 and Prosecutor Juan Martinez was visiting the Estrella Mountain Women's Jail to participate in a previously scheduled deposition. Walking into the jailhouse complex, he went through the normal routine of metal detectors and scans before walking towards the visitor's area where all legal representatives were required to check in and wait. The visitor's area at the Estrella Mountain Jail is a surprisingly large room filled with open seating that provides a clear view for the watchful eyes of the on-duty detention officers that monitor all interactions between the incarcerated and their visitors. As Prosecutor Martinez made his way to the section of the room assigned to legal representatives, he noticed that one of his infamous defendants was in the process of meeting with a visitor that he didn't recognize. And as luck would have it, he found himself at exactly the right time and place to catch Jody Arias in the process of handing two magazines to one of the guards that was intended to be given to her unknown visitor. Getting a closer view, he could see that the two publications were copies of Digital Photo Pro and Star Magazine, a popular grocery store tabloid that just happened to feature a cover story about another famous defendant awaiting trial who had previously been compared to Jody Arias by the media. The cover of the Star magazine featured none other than the most hated mother in America, Casey Anthony. Prosecutor Martinez rightly suspected that the magazines may contain important information that she was attempting to smuggle outside of the jail. And with that suspicion in mind, he asked the detention officers to confiscate the magazines while he sought a warrant from the presiding judge. But much to Jody's chagrin, a short time later, the warrant would be granted, giving Prosecutor Martinez the two confiscated magazines so that he could ascertain what Jody Arias was trying to sneak outside of the jail. Taking the magazines back to his office, he began to carefully review each one, looking for any obvious clues or hidden paraphernalia between the pages. In his initial inspection, it appeared as though they were devoid of any information or any apparent signs that either had been tampered with. But Juan Martinez knew his defendant had a long history of duplicitous and underhanded behavior. So in a last ditch effort, he handed both publications to his paralegal who would attempt to make a more thorough review. A short time later, his paralegal returned to his office and notified him that she had made an important discovery. Written in the center bindings of various pages were what appeared to be coded messages that were written in pencil throughout each magazine. She then flipped to page 37 and showed him the barely visible words that read, We can fix this. Flipping forward a few more pages was another cryptic message that said, Directly contradicts what I've been saying for almost a year. It quickly became apparent that these small entries were a part of a larger message that had been intended for someone outside of the jail. Eventually, after a thorough examination of each publication, Prosecutor Martinez was able to decipher the message in its entirety using a coded key written in the binding of the other magazine. The decoded message was completely damning, and later it was determined that the message had been intended for Jody Arias's former boyfriend, Matt McCartney. And what the decoded message revealed was a much deeper plot by Arias to manufacture evidence in her upcoming trial, which was not only a crime, but had the potential to completely destroy her defense long before her trial would even begin. Jody Arias had attempted to solicit plea bargains with Prosecutor Martinez's office on more than one occasion, but after conferring with the Alexander family, they had all been denied. Jody seemed to understand the gravity of the charges against her, and by the summer of 2010, 
Her case was spinning completely out of control. If she had any hope of exoneration and avoiding the death penalty, something miraculous would have to occur before her upcoming trial. And a miracle she would receive, as a seemingly impossible stroke of luck, came in from an anonymous source that would provide her attorneys with the compelling evidence that they desperately needed at exactly the right moment in time. Out of the blue, Kirk Nurmi's office received an anonymous email that included electronic copies of letters allegedly written in Travis Alexander's handwriting. The letters seemed to show Travis in a very unflattering light, and if they could be validated, they could help prove Jody's claim of self-defense in her upcoming trial. Attorney Kirk Nurmi was overjoyed at this development and quickly submitted the letters to the court so that they could be validated through expert handwriting analysis. And if the handwriting could be verified, it would be compelling evidence to support Jody's claims and could help sway the jury towards a not guilty verdict. Many weeks later, the expert analysis report was sent to Kirk Nurmi's office and to his dismay, the report conclusively determined that the letters were nothing more than an elaborate forgery. Attorney Nurmi was incredibly disappointed and would now have to meet with his client to let her know of this unfortunate development since they could not be submitted as evidence for her trial, unless the originals could be provided for authentication. But to the surprise of absolutely no one, in his meeting with Jody, she would explain that the original letters had conveniently been destroyed. But not one to be deterred by facts and evidence, Jody Arias would counter the expert report with claims that someone in her life had personally seen the original letters written by Travis Alexander. And just who was this person who could verify her spectacularly unlikely story? Well, it was none other than Jody Arias's former boyfriend, Matt McCartney. Attorney Nurmi would agree to meet with Matt McCartney in an effort to conduct due diligence for his client and to verify Jody's story. But by the end of that meeting, it was obvious that McCartney had made a deal with the devil and was participating in telling lies for Jody Arias. And as a result of Attorney Nurmi's meeting with Matt McCartney, it was determined that he was not a credible witness. After informing Jody that her attorney would not attempt to contest the ruling against her, Jody Arias would write this coded message and attempt to have it delivered to her former boyfriend through a coded message hidden inside two magazines. The same message that had been intercepted by Prosecutor Martinez in August of 2011. The coded message reads as follows. You effed up. What you told my attorney the next day directly contradicts what I've been saying for over a year. Get down here ASAP. See me before you talk to them again and before you testify so we can fix this. My interview is excellent, but we must talk ASAP. Jody Arias had been caught trying to orchestrate the intentional fabrication of evidence prior to her jury trial which was a crushing blow against her and any chance that she had to ever see the outside of her prison walls. But the veteran pathological liar remained defiant and would attempt one final effort to use the manufactured evidence as a means to destroy Travis Alexander's reputation in the court of public opinion. And what she was about to do would demonstrate the vile and unimaginable depths she was willing to go to avoid the death penalty and secure her exoneration. Even if it meant using her own mother to peddle her lies to the one place that could put her salacious and fantastical story in front of the eyes of untold millions. This is the fury of a woman scorned, the Jodi Arias case, episode four. In episode three of this series, we had begun the analysis of the Jody Arias interrogation that occurred shortly after her arrest. And in today's episode, 
we're going to pick up right where we left off, because some of the most impactful parts of that interrogation happen in the latter part of their conversation. And it will demonstrate the depths that Jody Arias was willing to go to obfuscate the truth and do everything in her power to avoid a conviction for the homicide of Travis Alexander. And I have pictures of you in Travis's bedroom with Travis, pictures of him, and it's obvious you guys are having sex, taking photos of each other, and they're dated and time-stamped on the day he died. Are you sure it's me? I mean, that because I Joe, was not there. It's you. And you know it's you. At this point of the interrogation, Jody Arias has already spent well over an hour denying any and all involvement in this case. The very first version of her story was that she was never in Arizona, but in a matter of less than 24 hours, she will go from an obstinate defiance to radically changing her narrative to one that will involve a completely absurd intruder story. A story that she will maintain for over two years. But before we arrive at her final version of events, her self-defense storyline that she touted at trial, we will find important clues throughout this entire interrogation that will lead us to a clearer understanding of what actually happened on June 4th, 2008. I know all the details of this case. The only thing I don't know is why. Why did you choose to go visit Travis that day? And why did you do what you did? I never why, heard Travis? You did. You hurt him. That's why we're here. That's why I flew up here. Because I needed to talk to you about this. I can just arrest you and throw you in jail, but I want to know why. Why did you do this to him? I wouldn't hurt Travis. He's done so much for me. The first three videos I created on this channel were of the Jody Arias case. And since that time, I have received a striking number of comments that have all blamed Travis Alexander for his own homicide. We continue to live in a society that seemingly wants to assign responsibility to victims for causing the crimes committed against them. And this is precisely why I discuss these cases in such great detail. Because victim blaming is a huge problem in our culture and one that we desperately need to reassess. This will be the one time I say this in this entire video. Travis Alexander was not a perfect person, but no one is. And I imagine that if any one of us had a microscope put to our lives, exposing every mistake we've ever made, discussing it for weeks on end in a very public jury trial, that not one of us would make it through that process unscathed. Jody Arias continues to enjoy a considerable fan base who has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars supporting her while she remains incarcerated. But allow me to demonstrate just how considerable the support for Jody Arias truly is. Right now on Jody Arias' personal website, you can buy this ballpoint pen picture of whatever it is for the incredibly low, low price of just $5,000. But don't you worry, she has other options if that's a little too rich for your blood, but you still have a refined palate and a fastidious taste for art. But this option is a truly bargain basement deal. It's a colored pencil art on paper that reminds me of pictures that students in my eighth grade art class made. But you can own this beautiful, striking work of art, affectionately named Couch Potatoes, for only $1,000. $500. But wait, if you buy it in the next 30 minutes, she'll throw in Hitler's coffee cup and some face paint from John Wayne Gacy at no extra charge. Representatives are standing by to take your order. Just call 1-800-I-have-an-unhealthy-obsession-with-the-serial-killer to place your orders while supplies last. Listen, I realize that it sounds ridiculous. And that's because it is ridiculous. I wanted to be objective about her ongoing exploitation of people who seem to care more about her appearance 
than they do her own admission to the brutality of what she did to someone that she just admitted had done so much for her. But absolutely no human being deserves to endure the kind of suffering that Travis Alexander endured. And then to have his reputation torn to shreds by the same person convicted of his homicide, a woman who is now playing the part of the victim. And if we have any hope of leaving our children a better place than we found it, then we owe it to the next generation to stop blaming victims, stop turning their killers into celebrities, and remember that people who loved Travis Alexander lost their son, their brother, and their friend. And that is what matters most in this case. There's so much evidence in that house. So much. And it all points to you. I, I lived there. <sighs> I was there for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. I know you took pictures of him in the shower just before he died. I don't think he would allow that. Mm -hmm. And the camera actually took a couple of photos by accident during the time he was being killed. Really? Yeah, Joey, really. You were there. Quit playing this game. It's time for you to just come out and, I and didn't tell know. me. I didn't know. I did not hurt Travis. I did not hurt Travis. This is where it all began in my very first video. In this moment, Jody is trying and failing to convince Detective Flores that she didn't hurt Travis. And over the last several minutes, we've observed Jody doing what she does best, lie. But just for a moment, try to imagine how things would have transpired if Jody hadn't left the camera behind and law enforcement had never recovered those pictures. Now, the legal analyst in me wants to believe that the DNA, hair, hand, and fingerprints that she left behind was more than enough to convict her of Travis's homicide. But on this very same day that Jody Arias was being arrested and undergoing the interrogation that we are watching right now, another crime was unfolding on the other side of the country. A grandmother in Florida that was calling in a panic to 911 to report her grandchild missing. Her grandchild that hadn't been seen in an entire month and that same day would begin the catastrophic search to find Kaylee Marie Anthony. But that case would demonstrate the critical importance of evidence in a case where the defendant would also lie and conceal the truth at every possible opportunity. And if not for those deleted pictures being recovered by law enforcement, as well as the associated timestamps from the camera that Jody attempted to destroy, we may now be listening to the new Peacock series featuring an exonerated former defendant, Jody Ann Arias. I wouldn't do that to him. We have the pictures. Can I see the pictures? We have your blood at the scene. Your hair with blood at the scene. explain the blood and the hair. I don't know about my left palm print. How can you explain the blood and the hair? Well, because I used to bathe Napoleon all the time. No, Jody, you absolutely cannot explain it. Not like that. Unless, of course, Napoleon was a rabid hyena that bit your finger off while you were bathing him and then also made sure to pull your hair out of your head that just happened to get stuck against the same wall of the room where Travis was later found. Are you following me, Jody? Because you're not making any sense. 
But this entire interaction shows the incredible lengths that pathological liars will go to maintain their web of deception. Despite the fact that catastrophic evidence has just been leveled against her, she seems to just shrug it off and begins to make claims that there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for why she seems to be all over the crime scene. And I would be willing to bet my purple Lamborghini and my high-rise mansion in the Himalayas that this kind of dismissive attitude and loose relationship with the truth is something that Jodi Arias still demonstrates to this very day. Because her defiance continues to demonstrate her inability to grapple with reality in a way that makes any sense. And when you consider that people continue to passionately defend Jodi, regurgitating all her lies throughout all forms of social media, it shows you just how effective her campaign of misinformation has been and continues to be. Because despite the mountain of evidence that convicted her of Travis Alexander's homicide, people continue to ignore the truth and believe that Jody Arias was the victim all along. And, um... You haven't been there since April. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. well, He's had the house cleaned several times since then. And this hair was not just a, a hair, you know, from the shower or something. This hair was stuck with blood and obviously had blood on it. At the time, it got stuck where it, where it ended up. My there's hair no been way. All over. There's no other hair. Can you take place. Can you take a hair sample? And we like, have your DNA. No, no, no. But I mean, like, you know how they can do drug tests and find out when things were done. No, can you? We can't do that. Can't you measure the time? We maybe? have DNA matching that hair to you. Okay, I know, but my and hair... that hair had a follicle on it, and that means that that hair wasn't there very long. The follicle will usually dissipate and go away after a certain time. It'll fall off the hair itself. This is a moment where Detective Flores is demonstrating a mastery of his craft as a law enforcement officer. Many years ago, I worked with a criminal defendant that was being investigated for a crime that we later learned he didn't commit. Thankfully, he would later be removed from the list of suspects after DNA conclusively excluded him from the case. But because his hair had been found at the crime scene, I would learn a considerable amount of information concerning hair follicles. During our investigation of his case, I learned that a human hair can have an attached hair follicle for up to four months depending on the conditions and the surrounding environment that it was found in. I would venture to say that Detective Flores knows this, and he knows that telling Jody that her hair could have been left at Travis's house back in April and could still have an attached follicle months later in June, but he doesn't want to give her an inch. Now, I'll be honest, I do have an issue and think it can be highly problematic that police are legally allowed to lie, but in this situation, he's more making an omission. And when you consider the gravity of this situation, as well as his opponent, who also happens to demonstrably show traits consistent with pathological lying, it's perfectly understandable why he doesn't want to validate any argument that she could use as a reprieve. It's the beginning of many strategic moves that will eventually pay off by compelling Jody to start doing the one thing that she hates most, telling the truth. Well, when I would okay. brush my Jody, hair there, I mean... This one, you absolutely cannot, can, you cannot explain that away. You either had blood on your hand and you touched the wall, or there was blood on the wall and you touched the blood. Could my palm print have already been there and then blood touched it? Jody. Jody. This is over. This is absolutely over. You need to tell me the truth. Listen, the truth is I did not hurt Travis. Okay, so we're Jody, safe. Jody, you can continue to do this, okay? A records check shows you that you uh, has reported a a gun stolen, 25 auto, just happens to be the same K-9 
caliber as a weapon used to kill him. As we all now know, Jody Arias has demonstrated a long, torrid history of pathological lying that her own parents revealed dates back to her early adolescence. And while Detective Flores clearly suspects that obtaining a confession from her is going to be exceedingly difficult, he is using every law enforcement trick in the book to try and compel her to tell the truth. Throughout this entire investigation, Detective Flores slowly reveals small sections of the iceberg of evidence against Jody and tries to show her the enormity of the situation and how the truth is slowly inching towards her. The last bastion of hope that she has left to stay out of prison is gone. She just doesn't realize it yet. As he reveals that he knows about the 25 caliber weapon that Jody stole from her own grandparents, she doesn't budge. She's bent over and her closed off posture clearly expresses her guarded stance at this moment of their interaction. But Jody has spent the entirety of her life misleading, manipulating, and deceiving countless people that have come in and out of her life. She's been backed into corners before, but never when the stakes involved whether or not she would spend the rest of her life in prison. She's not just fighting to maintain a lie. She's fighting for her life. And Detective Flores is going to have to bring out something truly compelling to get her to start telling the truth. The 25 auto was used to yeah, along with multiple stab wounds. Jody, if you want, I can show you some pictures of him. Do you want to see pictures of him? Part of me does and part of me doesn't. Why, because you don't want to remember? No, I Jody. just, there's a morbid curiosity. Jody. I wanted to know how he died. We can keep playing these games. Over and over again, I'm not going to believe you. All when right. you start telling me the Listen. truth, then I can believe you. But I can't deny this evidence. I can't. The trip you took doesn't make sense. The opportunity was there. Your pictures on that date with him. Your blood is in the house. Mixed with his. Mixed. Not alongside, but mixed. Your hair is there with blood, and your palm print is there in blood. Was it? I, it's over. Could it have been my blood from your before? Your image is not important right now. Saving the rest of your life is. Listen, if I'm found guilty, I don't have a life. And there it is. Jody Arias has just announced to the world why she will never tell the real, unadulterated truth about what she did to Travis Alexander. Because she knows that the only way that she will ever have the faintest possibility of seeing the light of day outside of the walls of Perryville Prison is for her to maintain the lie that she's the victim and that she was only defending herself from the man that she now claims was a horrendous monster. But allow me to give you some insight into the planet-sized ego that is somehow contained in the tiny frame of Jody Ann Arias. On February 23rd of this year, Jody wrote a blog post on her website. And yes, you heard that correctly. She has a website and a blog that she writes for regularly. And in this particular entry, she was complaining about a piece of art that she had sold, but there was a mix-up with her website's art administrator. Oh, and yeah, you heard that correctly too. She employs people who work for her to ensure that she continues to make money while incarcerated for the murder of Travis Alexander. And this is what the humble and innocent victim Jody Arias wrote about that situation. And I quote, Not everyone who buys my art does so to support me. Sometimes it's speculative as an investment. Sometimes it's it's bought as a gift for someone else. Other times, the buyer just wants something I made, touched, and quietly obsessed over for many hours. Unquote. I couldn't conceive of a human being capable of a more demonstrable display of egotism and arrogance. 
Jody Arias has grifted untold thousands by maintaining the lie that she is innocent. And despite her lack of freedom currently, she lives more comfortably than a vast majority of middle-class Americans do right now. And her fame is predicated on one of the most vicious and horrendous crimes that we've seen in our generation. And in a time where our culture puts such a considerable priority on physical appearance, I can't help but wonder if it would even matter to her supporters if she admitted to the truth. What a time to be alive. I'm not guilty. I didn't hurt Travis. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. Was there anybody else with you? I was traveling alone the whole time. Was there anybody else with you at Travis's house on Wednesday the 4th? I was not at Travis's house on Wednesday the 4th. You were? Because that's when the blood was left on, uh, the bloody palm print was left on his wall. I don't know what to tell you. If you were in my shoes and I had this evidence against against you, what would you say? If I had that evidence against you, it would yeah. be pretty obvious. But I guess being in my position, I, it just seems so impossible. I want to see it. I want to know. I mean, I'm not like I'm not a murderer, but I guess if I were to do that, I would wear gloves or you know something. I just. Following Jody's conviction, she agreed to an interview with a local Fox affiliate. And in that interview, she prominently declared that she would ask for the death penalty during her sentencing phase. And in this first formal interrogation, she makes that declarative statement for the very first time. But this comment isn't the assertive words of a victim, but rather the gaslighting manipulation of a seasoned professional who has spent the entirety of her life lying through her teeth. She seems to think that at this moment, making such a considerable and declarative statement will somehow deter Detective Flores from pushing her any further for a confession. Because she genuinely seems to think that only someone innocent would make such a grandiose statement. She thinks she's far more clever than she actually is because she follows this declaration with a statement that is intended to point to her innocence, but in actuality, it only more clearly demonstrates her guilt. She tells Detective Flores, I'm not a murderer, but if I were to do that, I'd wear gloves. You see, this is an extremely common mistake that many criminals make when they decide to speak to the police. They think they can somehow reason and talk their way out of trouble by making statements like this. But in reality, all it does is strengthen the suspicion and the eventual criminal case against them. Because eventually, when the evidence forces Jody to change her story, these kinds of statements prove that she is a chronic manipulator incapable of being honest about virtually anything, most especially anything that casts her in an unfavorable light. And that is just one of the countless reasons why Jody Arias would go on to be convicted of first degree homicide. But over the course of the next few minutes, Detective Flores is about to do something that is exceedingly rare for him. He's going to make a mistake. So pay very close attention, and if you catch it, write the timestamp in the comment section below before I chime back in. Let's continue. How could mine? I don't know. I know you tried to wash him off. Try to get some of the blood off. Try to clean him up a little bit. But you're even denying the pictures of you being there. There's pictures of you laying on the bed in pigtails. Pigtails? Yes. And I've got pictures of you that I've blown up, and you've got the little mole right there. It's the same one. It's you. It's obvious. I can show you some of these pictures. Do you want to see the pictures? Will that change your mind? I mean, I am curious. Okay, let me take a break then. Let me go find them. And I'll bring them and show you. I wasn't there. But you need to think about what you're saying. This continuing to lie is not going to help you. If you know, it did something I didn't do, it won't help me either. Okay, let's say for a second that I did. And I say, 
I did it. Mm -hmm. I mean... The motive is there. The jealousy issue. But I wasn't... I wouldn't even say it was jealous. I mean, there, um, there may have been some jealousy there, but... Then what is I think it? What anyone, caused this? I think if, you know, if anyone, maybe Travis was jealous, but... <clears throat> <laughs> what an entirely ridiculous statement from Jody. Travis was the jealous one? Right. You mean the guy whose tires you slashed twice because you couldn't stand the fact that he was dating someone who wasn't you? Give me a break, Jody. But I especially love how after she claims that Travis was the one who was jealous, Detective Flores is completely unable to keep his composure and loudly clears his throat. But did you catch it? Did you catch his misstep? You see, one of the most fundamental things that detectives and law enforcement agents are taught concerning proper methods of interrogation, including the read technique, among others, is to never, ever interrupt someone in the process of putting their own foot in their own mouth. This was masterfully demonstrated by the detective who interrogated Colonel Russell Williams. He understood that silence is not the enemy. It's your ally, and interrupting an offender in the process of providing a damning admission is one of the worst things you can do in this situation. Jody was in the process of making a statement that started with her saying, let's say for a second that I did it. She pauses, and instead of letting her continue down the plank, Detective Flores chimes in by saying, the motive is there, the jealousy issue. Him stating to Jody that she was jealous of Travis is the truth. She was. But to a woman who is the clinical definition of a narcissist, telling Jody that she was the jealous party is a critical and unfortunate misstep. Because she could be in the middle of confessing to the crime and interjecting anything that attacks her ego in any way would be more than enough to stop her in her tracks entirely. Now, I will concede that hindsight is twenty twenty. And Detective Flores has had a long track record of exceptional police work. But I can't help but wonder where Jody was going at that moment with that line of dialogue. Who knows, maybe I should invest in some of her art and ask her. <laughs> That's not what everybody else says. Well, they know he was jealous, but they think that you are absolutely obsessed. Obsessed is the word that they use. That's the word I hear from everybody. Fatal attraction. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Look at Jody. Jody had to have done this, or she got someone to do it for him. There's not one person that says anything else. Why is that? That's the perception they have of you. And there's a reason for that perception. Maybe because it's true. And maybe because we kept hanging out. Mm -hmm. But not because it's true. Cause this. I can prove you were there. I can prove it. But what I don't have is I don't have answers on why it happened. Or, you know, maybe something just got out of hand. Just, maybe maybe things got out of hand. Did you and, find the, the, the gun? Maybe that would... Tony, we're just playing games here. That gun was in your possession. When did you report it stolen? Now, I realize that it's very obvious that I find Jody Arias to be a truly reprehensible human being. And apparently, I've read more than a few comments from people who criticize my content for being overly biased. But here's the thing about that. In the totality of my legal career, I have never once met an entirely objective lawyer, paralegal, judge, expert, or jury for that matter. For most of my career, it was my job to spend untold hours writing heavily biased pleadings that were entirely slanted in favor of our clients. It was quite literally my job to be biased, taking sides and using every legal remedy available at our disposal was the definition of what made an aggressive and competent legal advocate. And I take the time to point that out because there seems to be this misconception in the true crime community that the only way to discuss these cases is by presenting the facts in a purely objective way. 
clearly, I very passionately disagree. In addition to Jody Arias' art website that she runs from the comfort of her air-conditioned, tax-funded cell, she also has another website that is aptly named JodyAriasIsInnocent.com. And in March of 2022, the following was written on behalf of Jody Arias. Quote, It is no secret that Jody deeply regrets what she did, but no woman should ever lose her life or her freedom for successfully fighting off her abuser. And remember, each day that passes takes us one day closer to Jody's release date. Jody is actively telling the world that she didn't do it, that she's innocent, that she was the person wronged in this case, that she lost her life and she doesn't deserve to be locked up for her crimes and is in the process of seeking post-conviction relief, a procedure which has the potential to result in her eventually being set free. So as long as she continues to tell the world that she was the victim, then I will continue to advocate for the truth and remind the world that Travis Alexander is the only person who lost his life, not Jody, and that no evidence was ever shown before, during, or after her trial that in any way proved that she was the victim of any crime whatsoever. And in a country where money can and often does buy freedom, we have to remain vigilant when the likes of Jody Arias is trying to lie her way to being released from prison. But pay close attention to this next segment because over the next few minutes, Detective Flores is going to redeem his mistake by getting Jody to slip up and admit to something that directly links her to the crime scene in a way that will make her lies completely untenable. Um, I didn't even know that there were guns until my, grandpa- my grandparents reported it stolen the day that their house was broken into. When was that? I don't remember. It was a few months ago, maybe. What did you do with the gun? I don't have a gun. They're going through your house right now, so are they going to find anything there that will lead you back to this? I don't think they would. I mean, there's nothing that could link me there. I mean, that's pretty compelling, I have to admit. If you found my palm print there, I don't know. I just, that's... Do you have a pair of sweatpants that's got stripes around the backside and zippers? Um... Somebody's seen you wearing those before. I've got so many clothes. Yeah, I think I do. Wait. I have a, well, I have zippered one that zips in the back. Mm-hmm. It's got like stripes, uh, like big stripe on it and so, well, It's got the black the stripe all the way down and they're white. It's yeah. got the black. I have those right at the house. Okay. It's got, um, I have two pairs actually. One is too small and one is just about right. Um, the other one I bought anyway, that was too small because it was on sale and it's a good deal. Um, but yeah, they have stripes and they have zipper. Well, what does that mean? What is that? Did I believe you were wearing a pair like that when this, when this happened? Remember I told you about the camera? It was taking pictures by mm-hmm. accident. Mm-hmm. The camera was upside down. It flashed. Another time, the camera flashed. It looked like it was on the ground. Maybe it was kicked. But it took pictures. And it's obviously a female. Mm-hmm. And one of them was wearing those pants. Oh, I didn't even bring those pants on that trip, so. Okay, so did you catch that? A short time ago, Jody admitted to having owned a pair of pants that matched the ones seen in the pictures taken during the commission of the homicide of Travis Alexander. But immediately after she realizes the gravity of her accidental admission, she sits there, says, hmm, and you can almost see her mind working a mile a minute trying to think of a way to concoct a lie on demand. But do you know what I find incredibly interesting? That she said that she didn't even take those pants with her on her trip. Because that's a very odd thing to say when she's been telling Detective Flores this entire time that she was never in Mesa, Arizona. So what in the world is she talking about saying that she didn't even take those pants? Why would she even need to make that distinction if she wasn't anywhere near Mesa, Arizona in the first place? Now, a short time from now, Detective Flores is going to bring out the big guns and prove to Jody once and for all 
that she was in Mesa, Arizona, and we will get to watch in real time just how far Jody Arias was willing to go to maintain a lie. But Detective Flores is about to give Jody one last big guilt trip before he leaves for a few minutes to let her sit and stew under the enormity and consequence of her decision to continue to lie. But watch her body language throughout that entire section where she's left alone. You can tell that she has a long history of learning how to cope with extremely stressful situations that she likely created throughout her entire life. But when Detective Flores gets back, Jody Arias will make a stunning confession that will demonstrably reveal that she is incapable of telling the truth unless or until it benefits her. And if we find those pants, is that going to make my case a little bit better? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take a little break, but I need you to think about what you're doing here. Because the best thing for you to do is to tell me the truth. Tell me exactly what happened. Because you know what? I think your mom and your dad really deserve the truth. They're going to be asking. And it's absolutely, it, it's so important that you tell me why this occurred, what was going through your mind, and what caused you to do this. It happened, and I can prove it happened, and there's no doubt in my mind, and there absolutely is no doubt in anybody else's mind who's investigating this, that you were there and that you did this. But I'll let you think about that, okay? And yeah, I'm going to go look for some pictures, and I'll bring them over, and we'll continue this discussion, okay? Let me go find them. I'll be right back. I'm not a murderer. I just bought a gun. Yeah, Jim. Mm -hmm. Whoa, wait a second, wait a second. You bought a what? Did you just say that you bought a gun? Because seven minutes and 50 seconds ago, didn't you say this? What did you do with the gun? I don't have a gun. I swear, this story just writes itself. You couldn't ask for a more effective example of someone completely eradicating their own credibility. And I hope that by now everyone's starting to understand the many reasons why I maintain such an adamant disposition towards Jody Arias. She isn't just an opportunist who grifts her many supporters into giving her their hard-earned money, but she will modify her story the second it becomes beneficial to her. Now, I really want to give Detective Flores a pass on this one, but this is another unfortunate gaffe in my opinion. He already believes that she was involved in the commission of this homicide. So Jody buying a gun is no small issue that shouldn't have been combed over and ignored. Especially when you consider that the gun would be found hidden inside the hood of her rental car and wasn't located until sometime after her arrest. Jody was in the process of fleeing the Wairika area and had already packed her bags to leave. 
And in those bags, law enforcement would find several large knives, as well as eventually finding the 9mm handgun that she legally purchased, but then hid in her rental car. I can only begin to imagine what she intended to do with it. But when you consider what she did to Travis, it's a safe guess to assume that it probably wasn't intended for hunting small game. Now, over the next several minutes, Jody is going to be shown the pictures that she took prior to and during the commission of Travis's homicide. Pay close attention to her demeanor because she's about to give away far more than she could have ever intended. You probably found it by now. Probably. I was taking it somewhere. These are just a few photos. And I want to be careful showing, not showing you certain photos Please because some show of them me. are very bad. That's obviously Travis's house, right? Remember that? If Travis were here today, he would tell you that if it wasn't me. No. My job is to speak for Travis right now. And everything Travis is telling me is that Jody did this to me. Have you ever shot that 25 auto? Mm hmm Have you ever touched it? The one that was stolen? No, I've never seen it. Like a toy gun. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a 25 looks like. I know what a 22 looks like. It's just like a 22, actually. Well, the 22s that I saw kind of looked like the ones in the westerns where they had the barrel and the long, you know. But there was another 22 in this in this store. It looked like a toy gun, so it looked like a squirt gun, like a water gun. Never go for that. Soon after you and him had sex on his bed. This whole interaction reminds me of flat earthers who categorically refuse to believe the truth regardless of how compelling the evidence. Over the next several minutes, Jody will be shown pictures that she took and her denials are a fascinating look into the mind of what I believe is a deeply mentally ill human being who has likely dealt with this dysfunction all her life and since early childhood. In my years of studying psychology, I have learned that the human brain is incredibly complex. And while there are many mental health diagnoses that help us to better understand the human condition, people are often far more than a simple diagnosis. Each and every one of us has vastly different life experiences, upbringings, and social environments that contribute to the people that we eventually become. In the case of Jody Arias, her pathological lying is very likely something that could be traced back to her childhood and an environment that helped to create her lifelong tendency to lie. But there continues to be a misconception that dysfunctional environments are secluded to excessively harmful conditions or mistreatment of children over the course of many years. However, more information has become available in recent years that demonstrates the importance of early childhood development. 
and the profoundly deleterious effects that excessive discipline, corporal punishment, and even failing to provide your children with a safe atmosphere can be on the current and future mental health of a growing child. While the evidence certainly doesn't imply that these behaviors are a certainty in creating any form of mental health dysfunction in children, studies do seem to suggest that these negative environmental conditions can play a considerable role in the future development of mental health disorders. And for me personally, knowing that has encouraged me to strive to be a better parent, because if my own childhood taught me anything, it was that we can learn from the mistakes of others and make the world for our children a better place than we found it. Now, in closing today, I want to tell you the unbelievable conclusion to the story that I began at the beginning of this episode. In early 2013, Sandra Arias, the mother of Jody Arias, would undergo an attempt to bypass the legal system and exonerate her daughter in the court of public opinion. At the direction and behest of her daughter, Sandra Arias approached a tabloid news organization known for running stories that were widely viewed as less than reputable. But what story or information did Jody send her mother to offer them? None other than the letters that had been proven to be a forgery by the court through expert analysis, and Sandra Arias had brought those letters to the National Enquirer. Now, you may recall that in prior episodes, Jody had been accused by Travis of stealing his journals, and this information became public throughout the course of her trial, which was a contributing factor in how it was determined that the letters were created by using Travis's journals to create the manufactured and fraudulent documents. But in 2013, Jody Arias was on every major news outlet throughout the entire country. Each night, the Arias trial was run as the lead story across all of the major networks. But despite the National Enquirer's long history of running news articles that were seen as nothing more than tabloid nonsense, they surprised everyone and did something entirely honorable and unexpected. They didn't run Jody's story. They exposed it. And I would like to read some of the incredible segments from the National Enquirer's article written on January 16th, 2013. Jody Arias has hatched a desperate, last-ditch plan to walk free from jail, and she's tried to drag the National Enquirer into her twisted scheme. And she's recruited her mother to contact the Enquirer and asked us to publish incriminating letters that Travis Alexander allegedly wrote during their romance. But a judge already tossed those letters out of court. A source close to Arias told the Enquirer, Jody is certain these letters are her ticket to freedom. She knows her only chance at acquittal is to convince the jury she was abused and that her ex-boyfriend was a bad guy. It's disgusting that she's willing to drag a dead man's name through the mud so she can go free. Jody wanted me to get these letters out to the public. I am only doing this because she asked me to her mother tearfully told an Enquirer reporter. Jody has several other letters in her possession, but she's holding off on releasing them. Yeah, sure she does. These letters are quite literally the only card Jody has left to play, noted the source. Getting them out to the public is her strategy to be acquitted of murder and escape the death penalty. That's how desperate and evil she is. She's manipulating her own mother from behind bars. Ladies and gentlemen, Jody Ann Arias. Now in closing today, I want to thank each and every one of you for making 2022 a year that I will never forget for as long as I live. It's not every day that you get to do something that you truly and completely love and have a whole community of people get behind you and support your dream. So to all of you that have watched my content, who have left encouraging messages and have expressed your support, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Now, if you enjoyed today's video, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. 
Taking the time to interact with the content on this platform is one of the most significant ways that you can show support to this channel. So thank you in advance for taking a moment out of your day to be here and for all that you do to make the BCM community a truly incredible group of people and to the exceptional group of people who have become our Patreon and YouTube supporters this year. I want to personally thank each of you for your contributions to this channel. I would not be able to do this work without the support that you've provided me. So thank you for making all of this possible. Also, immediately following this premiere, I am hosting a live Q&A on the BCM Discord server. I'll be answering your questions, discussing future content, and giving everyone a chance to join in. So make sure to check the description for the Discord server information and come join us in a few minutes from now for the live Q&A. I want to wish everyone a happy new year. I hope you have a safe and wonderful weekend with your families, loved ones, and significant others. And again, thank you for making this channel the success that it has already become. I am already working on several new series coming out over the next few weeks and over the beginning of 2023, so stay tuned. This is going to be a year to remember. This has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time.